So for now though, today we have three people coming up to talk to you about creativity in three different ways. So we're going to have coming to the stage, Joe Schofield. <laughs> Sherwin Shabaskani. <laughs> and Mr. Matt Wiley. And that was alphabetical order, by the way. All right, folks, take it away. I look forward to hearing you talk. Thank you. So, um, so guys, can everybody hear me okay? Perfect. And um, thank you very much for coming today. And um, we're joined on stage by uh, Shaveen Shazbakani from uh, Bacardi, Head of Advocacy, who's been working on numerous creative projects over, was it 12 years with Bacardi? And then also we've got Matt Wiley, who's uh, an extremely creative bartender and bar owner and operator from Scout, and I'm just here to try and make those guys look good. <laughs> so, <laughs> so each of us is going to talk for about 15 minutes. Um, it is very uh, condensed, but we make sure it's as engaging for you guys as possible, and if you guys have any questions, if there's not enough time for them at the end, please feel free. So, over to you, Chev. Thank you. Can we put it onto the slides, please? Hi guys, can you see the similarity? It's a little ring. Um, okay, so when Joe asked me to be part of this talk, I was like, yes, of course, I'm massively in. It wasn't until Angus Winchester accepted it, and then I went, fuck, what the hell am I gonna speak about? Like, it played on my mind for ages. I think I tried to get out of it about three, four times, but, um, but yeah, I mean, I played on my mind, I thought about it, and eventually about last month I sat down to write the presentation, but I was completely knackered. I'd spent 18 hours the day before doing a brand plan, I hadn't quite finished it, so I opened my computer, was about to start my work, but I was like, the nagging thought of like, what was this big creative idea? Like the talk was creativity, three ways. Describe your most innovative project to date in the process you got to. And as I was sitting in front of the computer, it struck me, I had 18 pages in front of me of creative ideas. You know, I think what I really struggled with and what I kind of criticized myself on is that like, creativity is often associated with that individual artistry, that big light bulb idea. You know, what I've come to realize is, is called the big C. But actually what we sometimes dismiss is that our daily lives are filled with creativity. It's a bit more of a humble, it's more of a small C. My name is Shaveen Shabaskani. I'm the head of advocacy for Bacardi Fire and Foreman. And for the last 10 years and many years before, I've got hundreds of small C examples. Whether it be cocktail competitions, presentations, parties, photography, writing scripts, just like loads and loads of examples. And actually what I took for granted was that every day creative day is something that we live and breathe in, in this industry. We're super lucky to work in the drinks industry and we're massively surrounded by it. But you know, for a lot of people, it doesn't actually come naturally. You know, we all have that creative streak, but for many, it's a struggle to get to, and it can often be quite hard to pull out. So in the next 15 minutes, I'm gonna give you five tips that I use to encourage that creativity. So tip number one, identify your most creative time of day. When are you at your creative peak? When is it the most easier for these ideas to flow? For me, it's about 11 o'clock at night, Maybe not last night at 11 when we were at the Bombay party, but generally just as I'm getting to sleep and I lie down, I start thinking about all the ideas that I've got um, and it's just, they come, they flood to me. Like I've known to write whole presentations on my iPhone in the dark whilst lying in bed. You know, it's funny because I sometimes say, I'll, I'll remember it and I'll write it tomorrow, but the next day I never do. And this is a huge topic in terms of creativity. Like, there's so much research when it comes to identifying your most creative time of day. For most of us, it's about 10 o'clock at night. The least creative time is about four o'clock. You know, and obviously we're all massively different. Um, it's amazing how our brain works and it actually has a timetable that we work to where it waxes and wanes over the day. But what's really important for you guys to know is identify your most creative time of day and structure your calendar accordingly. So for me at three o'clock, it's my slump. So that's when I do boring stuff like reporting or Excel. So if you don't know your creative time of day, maybe look back over the last few weeks, like was it a struggle to come up with the ideas? How did it work? And I tell you, once you know it, it's a complete relief because you can set that time aside, allow your brain to fire up and then let the creative ideas follow. And by the way, if you think or wonder why I'm using Matilda, I thought I'd use 
creatives that I'm inspired by to illustrate my points. Roald Dahl being a complete legend for many different reasons, but massively known for introducing ritual into his creativity. Tip number two, take inspiration from everything. You know, we've established that we work in a very creative industry, um, but it's very easy to take influence from our peers, opening bars, writing cocktail menus, doing competitions. Like how many of you that've got Instagram can say that most of your followers are your mates in the industry? Encourage yourself to follow people out of the industry and really expand your further afield. I used Mario Kart not only because he is a legend and I like grew up playing Mario Kart, but Miyamoto, who created Mario Kart, never employed people from the gaming world. Everyone that he employed was from other industries. He took inspirations from other fields because it didn't refine him. Tip number three, don't force ideas. Creativity takes time. And you know what, you can tell when an idea is being rushed or rehashed. Whenever I have a creative idea to come up with, I put it into the back of my subconscious, I let it live there for a little bit, and eventually by using tip two, I come up with that eureka moment. Um, this, this way of working has served me well over the years. It's something that I've always done, and I used to find it quite hard to articulate what it was and what it meant. And when I was prepping for this presentation, I found there was loads of studies about this way of thinking, um, and it's got loads of fancy sociological names. So this is actually referred to as creating a psychological distance. So as it sounds, it's basically thinking about a problem from a distance to allow it to come naturally. Let it incubate in your mind and take the time, and eventually you will have a higher level of thinking. And also, I did, I mean, okay, I used this not just because it's a pun, but Lucas films were absolutely integral in terms of bringing like, creativity to animation to film. Tip number four, set an objective. Does anyone know where this illustration's from? Yeah, so this was Dr. Seuss, um, and he made a bet with a friend that he could write a book cover to cover using only 50 words. And he did, it was Green Eggs and Ham. Now what that book did, it didn't just become a children's bestseller, but it coined a new creative theory which was about restrained creativity. Now I know that sounds like a paradoxical idea of restraining your creativity, but imagine you're faced with a project, you're sat at a computer with a blank screen, and you've got these endless amount of ideas coming on. How do you get to that big idea? Where do you start? By, by setting these restrictions, you're forcing yourself to delve deeper into what creative problems, and you can come up with a lot more unique ideas. This is particularly relevant in the drinks industry. You know, when creating cocktails, you know, you're faced with a back bar filled with loads of spirits, loads of ingredients, loads of inspirations, and it's unnerving and it can be quite difficult. And this is a great tip to use when coming up with cocktails. Tip number five, don't settle. So you've done all of the tips, you know, you've found your most creative time of day, you have set yourselves objectives, you've not forced the ideas, and you've got this big idea. Sleep on it. You know, the next morning comes, you're super excited, you want to run with it, but sleep on the idea. The best thing that you could do is question yourself. Like when I have an idea or when I'm working with someone, I think to myself, so what? What's the point? Is this actually good? Would I like it? You know, be your own worst critic. And if you're not your own worst critic, find someone that can be it for you. Get them to play devil's advocate and point holes in your idea because that's when you can really kind of take your creativity to another level. This was super exciting getting to write this presentation and there's so much out there when it comes to creativity. Um, I talked about five tips that I used. I think there was about 100 in there. There's so many things. And the main point that I wanna get from this section is like that humble sea of creativity is equally important as that libel idea. So, Take time, maybe try and use those tips and awaken your, awaken your own creativity. I'm gonna pass on to someone who's way more creative than me. <laughs> Matt, so. So, Matt, please. So um, I, I think Chef had a really interesting point there. Um, she's talked about big C creatives. And we always look at those people in the industry who might be like Michelangelo, Steve Jobs. But what they really aren't very open about it is they actually have hundreds of people working for them. This is why Michelangelo was so famous back in the days because he had a PR agent. He actually had all these people and he was arguably the first person to really make benefits of PR. So now we're going to go over to Matt Wiley, um, who's obviously um, going to talk a little bit about his project at Scout. Thank you. So, 
she she have touched on it um, about having this big idea, um, this big creative idea. And for me, Scout was the big creative idea. It was about creating a space that me and my team, we could use produce that you wouldn't normally expect to be creative with and find solutions for, for things in the future where it, we might run out of produce. We might not be able to get limes and lemons in the UK anymore. We might not be able to get bananas. We might not be able to get pineapples because we're running out of food in the world. And so for me, it was an exciting thing to be able to, to challenge what we, can what we can make and be creative with. And, and for us, our only restriction is produce. This is, these are some of the ingredients. Well, that's an ingredient. Um, but this is the way we go about creating our drinks. We first get our produce, either from the forager or from our local, local suppliers, and we see what we can be creative with. Every Friday, our forager sends us a list of, of ingredients. Those, those ingredients might not be available the following week. So then we take these ingredients, see how we can use them, and then we take some more ingredients, and then we see how we can introduce spirits. This is, this is how we get our list from the forager. You can see they're really obscure ingredients that sometimes no one's ever used before. So firstly, we, we might eat them, see how they taste, see how we can introduce other things that we might be more susceptible to using. Pineapple weed, beach roses, these are, these are the ingredients. This is actually picked about five minute walk from uh, Kalukale. This is an ingredient we use instead of black pepper. We, uh, we dry them down, we grind them, and we use it as a seasoning. Shizo leaves, these are ingredients that you wouldn't normally expect to grow in Britain, but these grow like from four different producers now. And the, this is what we use for acidity. And this is the thing that's really exciting for me. In London, we live in this cosmopolitan city, but there's actually produce growing all over the city. Um, Scout now is in a, in a borough called Hackney, and there's, there's a website you can follow called Harvest Hackney, where there's produce growing on every single street, from apples to plums. And this is just a list of the ingredients that we, we forage and pick ourselves. And at the end of the day, this is free food. This is free ingredients that we can put in our drinks. Um, and that's exciting to me. So for us, we're structuring our drinks, um, going actually against what Chev was saying. We, it actually forces creativity. We have to be creative. Sometimes we might have to change our cocktail menu five times in a week if, we, if, if something sells popular and, and we don't, we're not able to get those ingredients anymore. Our drinks are natural and pure. And what we try and do when we get the produce, we try and get it either preserving it or we put it in a drink in 48 hours. So we like really capturing the natural essence of, of what produce is. And then these are some of the processes that we use. They can be quite complicated and you, you might struggle to understand some of the things, but we, we spend a lot of time working with our staff to like create a training program. So pe my staff can be creative. They're allowed to be creative whenever they want. Whenever they want, there's a budget set aside for the staff to be creative all the time. We use a lot of fermentation. This is, this is a way that we can actually use produce for the winter. Last year, we, we messed up horribly. We got so excited because we had this, all these berries for summer. And by October, there was no more berries. And we were just making shit drinks with, with potatoes and parsnip. You know, we quite liked it, but you know, drinking, drinking potatoes for six months is a challenge. One of the other things that we, we try to use is uh, we try not to throw anything away. Like sometimes we have to, and it's a challenge like storing things, but this is, these are some of the things that we, uh, we make salts out of the, the pulps and stuff like that. We're big on carbonation. This is a way that we can create low ABV drinks and uh, I think this is like an exciting thing for us. And then from all the, the technical stuff, the drinks that go to the table are really simple, really elegant and easy drinking. So, so Matt, um, before you leave stage, tell us a little bit about Scout and the concept and why you decided to open Scout. 
for me, I, I like spending time in, out in nature, in, in the wild, and I'm passionate about the country that I was born. Um, we, we, Im we actually import and export so much produce. All of the British produce goes out of the country, and all like amazing berries that just leave the country that go all over the world. And, and we, we eat all of our produce from around Europe, and it's like, why do we do this? Why don't we like actually live off the land, live off the land and, and eat our own produce and be excited about it? And so obviously Scout's um, an extremely creative bar, and what do you do to harness your own creativity and that of the team? I, I find that I have, to be, I have to try and make drinks all the time. If I, if I take a step away from it, I, I actually find it a challenge to, to, to get back in and start getting creative again. I have to constantly be trying to be creative. Mm -hmm. Sure, and um, obviously um, I know a big thing for you is looking to other industries and Chef touched on it as well. Um, where do you draw your inspiration? Most of my inspiration comes from chefs. Like w Most of our techniques are like chef techniques and, and I think the way that chefs uh, extract flavor is, uh, is something that we can learn from and actually chefs, the way they extract flavor, we can actually teach the chef about actually putting flavor into liquid too. Cool. And uh, do you have any other philosophies about creating cocktails? For me, it's about making things that are delicious. You can be as creative or, or as simple as you want. Sometimes the most simple things can be creative because you're trying to overcomplicate things. And, and a simple idea is not always like a bad idea. Cool. Thank you. I'm going to take the cup off. Thank you for having that. So, uh, so now I guess it's my turn. Um, today I'm going to be talking about what I think was the most creative project I worked on. I want to be clear from, uh, from the get-go that it wasn't just me that created these menus, it was also my business partner, Chef Ryan Clift, and also the team at Tippling Club certainly contributed. We have a member of the Tippling Club team over here, Shin, who's uh, probably made more gummy bears than uh, anybody else. So yeah, so on to the slides, please. Uh, so this is um, Sensorium. Sensorium is um, a multi-sensory consultancy company that myself and Chef Ryan Clift have created. It's not Harry Potter and Lord Voldemort, before you think that. And, and the, the name comes from our, uh, the name of our cocktail menus, our sensory menus. So I started at Tippling Club roughly about two and a half, three years ago. And um, during my first week at Tippling, Ryan, who's had the restaurant for 10 years now, um, asked me what we wanted to do with the menu, and it turns out we had exactly the same idea. And um, Ryan had Tippling Club for the 10 years, and you know, it's the first avant-garde, first initiative bar in uh, Singapore. You know, they're doing things back then that are almost just becoming full circle now. Um, you see a lot of the processes and techniques that we're doing, but in a market that was uh, not quite ready for it, they had to adapt and evolve. Uh, Tippling Club has always been about engagement, fun. Like, we used to play like Beyonce and Madonna in the dining room of a fine dining restaurant, um, which was actually taken really well. And um, what we wanted to do, we wanted to create menus that could engage our guests. This is a market where they're not really used to that sort of engaging hospitality, hosting people, asking them how the day we are. So we need to create something that could um, break down those barriers. So this is our first menu. Uh, I'm going to show you a short video before we go into a bit more depth.
Cool. So I want to be very transparent that this menu wasn't about just aroma. The whole concept was about triggering memory. The concept took us about 10 months from uh, the date we decided to do it until execution. And I'm not going to lie, during those 10 months, you do absolutely shit it because you think everybody else can do the same thing and is going to do the same thing. It originally started off as an A4 piece of paper, scratch and sniff. Um, and then the project evolved. We worked on it. We talked to different people, talked to the team. And that was one of the key driving factors of how the menu became such a success. Um, we work with a company called IFF. If you can just leave the slides on for me, please. Um, so IFF was, um, stands for International Flavors and Fragrances. Um, and we turned to them at day one and said, this is what we want to do. Can you help us create some aromas that are designed to trigger memory? Memory triggers work because of the way the brain is designed. The part of the brain that's responsible for associative learning is next to the part of the brain that is uh, responsible for sensory information. So hence, while you're walking down the street, you get a burst of freshly cut grass. It takes you back to a specific moment in your childhood. We wanted to have this, um, this thing, as I said, like an engagement tool. So you get one menu between four or less guests. You take them out, you'd smell them, you pass them around. We also designed it so it was essentially our business card. We encourage guests to steal the menus, take them away. So if you go and meet your friends for a coffee the next day, you pull it out your bag and you go, oh, look, I've got the smell of rain in my pocket, encouraging more footfall and traction into the bar. Some of the aromas were extremely conceptual. The smell of rain is very personal to me, being from Manchester. We've got forest, we've got grass. But we wanted to make sure that everybody um, that was coming into the bar had, had some sort of interaction with those aromas. So who is IFF? International Flavors and Fragrances. And the best way that I can describe what these guys do is if you walk into a supermarket or a small convenience store, there's a handful of these global companies that pretty much touch everything in there. You know, so we're talking soaps, we're talking sweets, we're talking confectionery, we're talking crisps. Anything you can guys think, think of, including spirit brands, a lot of these can be made um, by one of these companies worldwide. We have had a relationship with IFF for eight years, and the key word here is relationship. We help them with projects, and then in turn, they help us. So this is um, Karen on the right. She's a huge supporter of Tipling, came there as a guest about eight, nine years ago, and ever since then, she was the only person we really wanted to talk to about this project. We did talk to a handful of the other companies, but because of that relationship we have with those guys, they were the natural choice. So with the first menu, we looked to the past with memory triggers and aroma. Next, we looked to the future with aroma and dreams and desires.
So, um, so there's a few links from the last menu to this menu. Obviously, it's quite nostalgic in its feel and its design. And uh, we also developed the smell of a candy shop. And with IFF, we did a few smaller projects with them, worked for them for the smell of outer space. And um, what we really want to just get that message across is because we could be perceived as pretentious or whatever, but we were just about having fun. Each one of those gummy bears was made in-house by a member of the bar team. Isn't that right, Shin? <laughs> We used to make 1,200 gummy bears every single day. Um, everything that you served in the bar was by hand. I'm going to show you some of our drinks after. You would expect some of the garnish to come out of a pastry kitchen, but it was made by the bar team. So I'm going to quickly run you through the flavors of the gummy bears. If we can get the slides back up, please. So on the right, we'll start with the right. We have beauty, which was flavored with rose and makeup. We have happiness, which is citrus and honey. And next, I'm going to ask you guys in the room a very personal question. Who in the room was breastfed? Don't be shy, we're all friends here. So the next gummy bear was baby, and it was flavored with vanilla. So if you like vanilla, it means you were breastfed because the natural vanillins that occur in breast milk. The next gummy bear was power, flavored with spice and fire. The next gummy bear, the little red one, uh, was flavored with um, a very famous perfume. I'm not going to tell you which one because I don't want to get sued. But um, IFF have access to these recipes. They know what goes into these. They've got a specific machine that analyzes every compound that goes through it so they can break down and understand. But what I can tell you, that bear was flavored with peach, tonka bean, which is a natural aphrodisiac. And then we have the little green bear, the success bear. Success bear was um, flavored with the most expensive wine in existence, uh, Domaine Romani Conti like an incredible uh, burgundy. Next, the little blue bear, we have uh, peace, citrus, and jasmine. Next up, the other blue bear is holiday, pina colada, obviously, and sun cream. Next, we're starting to get into some weird flavors now. Next was knowledge, the gray bear, paper, and whiskey. And then the purple bear, this for me is, I hate the purple bear. So when we were developing this, we, had to, we gave IFF a direction. We were like, guys, can you give us these flavors? We did gummy bear tastings. And I reckon of this one, we had to eat about 100 different gummy bears. This was supercar. It's flavored with uh, metal, rubber, smoke. So when you're eating it, and petrol. So you know when you get like a bag of jelly beans, there's always that one that you wish you hadn't have had, and you spit it back out. This is the one for us. We did give our guests a warning, eat me last if you dare, because the flavors are very intense. And the reason it has petrol oil in, we translate that into white truffle oil. Cheap white truffle oil in the cocktail was a representative of the petrol. Um, and that's because white truffle oil is made from a petroleum compound called dipithylene 4. Next, we have a little brown bear, which is chocolate and strawberry. And last but not least, the revenge bear. So obviously, all these are dreams and desires, and are all very nice and very positive but we wanted to have a dark dream and desire. So like, how do we get revenge? How do we make um, a, that, that feel so different than the others? We added umami into the gummy bear to give it a completely different texture, and we flavored it with blood. So when we were sat around in one of our gummy bear tastings, um, we said to IFL, so guys, don't think I'm weird here, but we want a blood flavor. Do you guys have anything? And everyone in the room started laughing. And I was like, I don't really get it. What's the joke? And they're like, why do you guys think meat in supermarket tastes like meat? Which is pretty gross, I know. So why do we do these menus? We wanted something, like I said, it was about engagement and experience. We're all very fortunate enough where we live in a world now where I don't think good food and beverage meets our customers' demands, our guests' demands. I think we have to go a little bit further. I said the t philosophy of Tippling Club has always been about innovation and progression, but also the harmony between bartender and chef working together towards one goal. Here's an example of some of our drinks, or the sensorium drinks, as we now call them. Um, each one, we wanted our garnish to be a representative of our venue, representative of that relationship. And like I said, each one of these things looks as if it was made by the pastry team, but in fact, it was made by a bartender. The top left, we have what became to be one of our most recognizable drinks, the supersonic Negroni used um, supersonic sound waves to essentially age our Negroni. Just by disturbing the molecules, in turn, they became more, bi uh, more bonded. The bottom left um, is the pear cocktail, essentially like a pear daiquiri with different textures of pears. I love that concept when you go into a kitchen and you get one ingredient and different textures of it, so we need to translate that into a cocktail. 
The little thing in the middle is um, a pear sorbet. To make a batch of these, it used to take about three man hours. Dehydrated vanilla bean, pear sorbet, lime gelatin around the outside. You torch the dehydrated vanilla bean as it's going to the table. Again, adding that extra sensory element. In the middle, we have the rain cocktail from the first menu. Um, we have um, rain spirit. In, the, in rain, there is a very strong compound called geosmin, which we recognize as the smell of rain, and that's very present in beetroots. Make a beetroot distillate, and we make um, a stone spirit as well. We um, use this edible clay found in the plains of West Africa called kaolin clay. It's what the pregnant women eat out there to get the nutrients they need for their unborn child. It adds nice minerality. Lemon, soda, still very simple, like a twist in a gin fizz. Campfire, campfire flavored marshmallows, and peace, peace meringue. So we've been making classic cocktails. Some of these cocktails have been around for 100, 150 years. And for me, it doesn't make sense for us to still be making, you know, using the same garnishes that we were doing 100, 150 years ago. I understand the importance of aroma. It's estimated that 90, sorry, 80% of flavor comes from aroma when you're eating or drinking. It's the odor molecules being pushed into your nasal cavity through a process called retronasal olfaction. We understand that. We're like, why have our garnishes and cocktails not come so far when you compare it to the chef world? So this was part of our thought process. And obviously, we were very fortunate there, being able to work so closely with the kitchen team, breaking bread with them. They're always very supportive of our ideas and concepts. Um, but this information is accessible, it's online. You've got the world's best chefs producing cookbooks, writing blogs, teaching you how to do these things. We wanted to make sure our drinks were extremely fast. You know, if you can get those drinks out to guests extremely quickly, it might encourage them to get another round and putting more money into the business. Um, so each one of the garnishes and the whole cocktail take no more than 30 seconds. Quick shake, quick stir, garnish, drop it on, dehydrator, freezer, fridge, and straight to the table. Um, so all of our drinks were also priced at the same, $22. We didn't want our guests to be influenced by price point. We wanted them to come in and say, oh, well, I can save a couple of dollars there. I might just have that one. We wanted them to choose a drink that was special to them. Cool. And I think that's just about it. So we do have some time for questions. If you do have a question, raise your hand and let us know who it's directed at, and we can go from there. And I'm, I'm coming over with a mic for you, sir. Hi guys, um, could I have two questions or a couple of questions to two people? <laughs> yeah, fine. Um, uh, for you, I wanted to find out how, you said it took eight months, but how many physical hours do you work? Is it like you, you work six hours a day on cocktail development, three hours a day? Is there a set time that you actually work on doing the menu? And the second uh, question for Matt, when you get those lists from your forager, do they have like tasting notes? Or how do you know what you're gonna use? Literally zero tasting notes whatsoever. It's about trusting, they sometimes send samples, but they're actually quite expensive. So it's about trusting that the produce is, is fresh, but you can, you can call them up and ask them if, for some advice. And if you want something bitter, or if you want something like with a bit of acidity or something, they'll, they'll advise you. But yeah, sometimes you're like shooting in the dark a little bit. Cool. Any more questions? Yeah, anybody have anything to ask these folks? about the creativity or maybe about yeah. their bars or about their thought processes or what they had for breakfast. <laughs> Any questions at all? Cool. Well, uh, no worries, what? guys. We're going to be around for a little while, so if you just want to come and ask us individually, we're more than happy to oblige, so. All right, yeah? Cool. Okay. Cool. Well, let's, oh, here we go. There it goes. <laughs> um, hello. Uh, well, I want to ask just one question maybe for you especially for you. Uh, where did you find your inspiration to make the Tippling Club? So what was the like, main point that you decide to make this bar? So what was uh, the main point? So, so when it opened eight years ago, um, there wasn't really much of a fine dining scene in Singapore. Um, so Chef Ryan, he saw the opportunity there and wanted to create something. Um, he's always you know, had a great knowledge and, of, um, of the industry. He's always loves cocktails. and. It's actually, it's, it's a great partner to worry because if you, if you forget something, it's like, oh, Ryan, what's the, the, the wine in New York Sour? And he knows. He's got such an um, in-depth knowledge of wine, cocktails, food. And I think what he really wanted to do was to be able to showcase that into a venue. 
Something um, that we were known for was cocktail pairings. Uh, this was something that was being explored at the time. We were the first people to introduce it into Asia. Um, so yeah, and, and it was always just about creating a, new, a unique product. But for him, it was always flavor first, aroma, texture. And what's so important is that we did have those machines like Rotovarp Centrifuge, but it was just literally about extracting the best flavor possible. And that was the ethos of Tipling Club. Yeah. Actually, I actually have a question for you. So how do you go about keeping pushing yourself? You know, you just opened, uh, you said Scout just moved to a new place. How do you keep everything fresh? Is that through maybe more interaction with your coworkers? Is it, how do you do it? It's, it can be a challenge. Like being creative all the time is a challenge. And sometimes not everything that goes on the menu is always amazing, but it's about just trusting that what you put out is, is still tasty at the, at the time. But yeah, it's, it, can be, it can be challenging being creative all the time. I think, it's, I think you're, like I said before, you're your own worst critic. You know when you've done something amazing, you know when you can always do better. So like listen to that voice and say, right, okay. And also like take from your peers as well, like surround yourself by creative people and share your ideas with them. And the more you talk about it, the more it will develop. Joe, do you have any thoughts? Um, yeah, I think evolution. And uh, obviously for us, the team at Tipling was a key driving force. And, and it was, I love this Japanese uh, term that they often use in business called Kaizen. It just means continuous improvement. Even though we'd been working on those drinks for 10 months, working on the concept for 10 months, it's like, how can we be better? And um, yeah, that, that was our philosophy. It's just asking ourselves every day, how can we be better? How can we be faster? How can we be more engaging? Anybody else have any, any thoughts, any questions at all? No? All right, I guess they all feel fulfilled. Well, thank you all so much for being here for... Thank you all, Seth.